And so I tell you, Wednesday was pretty sparse. And so it's nice to have some folks outside of just our family here. And so thankful for that. Although I appreciate our family being here too. And uh, just a couple of things on announcements. Back there, the, uh, the Baby Palooza run ends on Friday. So if you're able to contribute anything for that, uh, then certainly uh, do so before Friday. That'd be great. And I know they'd appreciate that very much. And then also the Clarks, I mentioned this before, uh, they were supposed to be here last Sunday during the ice and all that. And so uh, anyway, we were able to reschedule them. Uh, that's missionaries to Liberia. And so they'll be here next Sunday evening. And so certainly keep them in prayer. They're supposed to be. I haven't talked to them. I can't imagine them going. Uh, but they were supposed to be in Fort Worth or the other side of Fort Worth today. And so I think it's pretty much a parking lot, uh, everything that I've seen on Interstate 20. And so anyway, I'm surely, surely they canceled that. But uh, anyway, keep them in prayer regardless. And that the Lord would open up good opportunities for them to be able to get into some different churches. It's hard enough being able to get into churches with COVID situation and all that. Um, but then to be able to have snow and, and everything else shutting down the country too, that's, that's a difficult time for sure. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. And I think that's all. Any other word or announcement this morning? All right, let's stand together. We'll start out in a word of prayer. Brother Dennis Trahan, would you open us in prayer, please? Amen. Let's take your red hymn books. Turn to 449. 449. <clears throat> 449, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Far <clears throat> away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth be set on every and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Far below the storm of doubt upon the world is beating. Sons of men in battle long, in of me withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can reach me, tis Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. For I am dwelling in Beulah let the stormy breezes blow their cry cannot alarm me. I am safely sheltered here, protected by God's hand. Here the sun is always shining, here this not can harm me. I am safe forever in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain. Underneath the cloudless sky, praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Viewing here the works 
of God I seek in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulahland. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Amen. <clears throat> that drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry just has no meaning. Amen. <laughs> Let's turn back to page number 19. Page number 19. <clears throat> there is a fountain filled with blood. Help us, Lord, to 
take what we do here today, apply it to our lives and share it with others. We do ask, Lord, if there's one among us that does not know you today, be that day they come to know you, the fullness of your grace, your joy, your peace and contentment. Pray, Lord, that we will bring honor and glory to your name here today with the songs we sing and the words that we say. We ask, Lord, if you'll take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Morning. Morning. We would take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I entitled my devotional The Day to Day Reset. I'll wait, I'll wait till you guys get there. I like reading when everybody's there. Okay, Luke 17, and I'll read verses 3 through 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. All of us have had people in our lives who have hurt us and do things to us that are wrong. God calls us to, and commands us to forgive them. Not just the first time they do it, but repeatedly. The pattern and model, model for forgiveness is set by the way God treats us. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. As well as it says in Isaiah 1.18, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Through the perfect example, God, also known as Eloa Silicot, which means God of forgiveness in Hebrew, we see the forgiveness of sin is pictured of a drastic and total change. Something as red as blood to represent sin can be forgiven and be presented as white as snow. Now our main scripture is not telling us to be a doormat and be abused. Just because we forgive someone does not mean we condone their actions or agree with their offense. There, there are biblical guidelines used in approaching someone and presenting things to the church for serious matters. While it is a paradox, obedience in this matter forgives, uh, obedience in this matter yields freedom. The truth is, is that we ourselves are in constant need of God's mercy and forgiveness. Because we need forgiveness on an ongoing basis, often for the same offense against God, we must not fail to extend forgiveness to others. Through obedience of forgiveness, we set ourselves free from the effects of the offense. Notice how scripture is a, is a command rather than a suggestion. Jesus sets the standard of forgiveness for believers. Of course, this, this does not mean that we allow ourselves to suffer repeated injury, but we cannot obey God and refuse to forgive those around us. While it is easier to cut people off and hold what they, do, what they have done against them, in the end it harms us far more than it impacts the offender. When you find yourself weary of forgiving someone else for, for their repeated offenses, remember the ongoing forgiveness that God gives to you. And I will leave those thoughts with you. Amen. All 
All right, it's the Red Books, page 102. 102, He Hideth My Soul. <clears throat> Great devotion this morning. <clears throat> A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to My soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. Me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and calm me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. Hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Amen. 216. Page 216. <clears throat> Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Remember, we sing, sing the end on the last verse. <clears throat> Jesus, the kind shepherd, found me, and now I am on my way home. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Restoreth my soul when I'm weary. He giveth me strength day by day. He leads me beside the still waters. He guards me each step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall 
follow me days all the days of my life when i walk through the dark lonesome valley my savior will walk with me there and safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life, all the days, all the days of my life. Amen. Great singing. One more. Let's turn to page three. Page number three. Jesus paid it all. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it whole, whole To Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He it white as snow for nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land Jesus paid it whole all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow, and when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all to him I owe. Left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. It's like me and brother Ethan were on the same page. Amen. That was great. That's great. <clears throat> Miss Kim, Miss Gail, and I have a special for us this morning. So 
boy sent for the man of God to pray. But Elisha, he told Naaman, go and dip yourself in Jordan. And let the cool waters wash your spots away. So he went right down to the river of Jordan. He went and right in. in the rushing water. He dipped himself. He dipped himself in the river of Jordan. This mighty river I may never see. So I find myself an altar in an old fashioned church, and my river of Jordan that will be. Yes, I'm on my way to the river of Jordan. And I'll wade right in. in the rushing water. I'm going down. I'm going down to the river of Jordan. And the cool. Appreciate that so much. If you would, let's take your Bible and go to the book of Acts this morning. Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> and whenever you find your place there, Acts chapter 5, then if you're able, then let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter number 5. <clears throat> and we're going to go down to verse number 12. Acts chapter 5, <clears throat> verse number 12. It says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed every one. I want to bring a message this morning of overshadowed overshadowed. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the safety that you've provided for us and allowing us to be able to be here this morning. Thank you for the provisions that you've given for the, uh, the, the power of the water that you've blessed us with so that we could be able to gather in this place. Lord, we know that there's many that are still waiting on that, and we pray, God, that you would continue to give uh, peace to their hearts, Lord, and, and continue to provide for their needs. And Lord, as those that are uh, here and, and those that are watching online, Lord, we, we come, we desire to be able to hear from you. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would speak to every heart and meet every need. We want to thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. <clears throat> in 1857, Jeremiah Lamphere uh, had a burden for God to, to use him in some great way. And, and he was uh, beginning to be very aware of the thousands of souls that were all around him. Uh, that were in need of a Savior. Uh, he was in New York City, and, uh, and he was just surrounded by people seeing the need time after time. And, uh, but, you know, the more he thought about it, he said, you know, I'm just, I'm just one man. This is a job for just thousands of men uh, to be able to, to meet this need. But he was continually praying to God. He said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And he would emphasize those two words. What would you have for me to do? He knew there was something that God wanted for him. And the Lord laid it on his heart as he continued to pray in that regard that, that maybe he could get more people praying. And, uh, you know, there needed to be more than just him that was, that was uh, praying. So he decided to have a prayer meeting at lunchtime. And again, this was at uh, New York City. There were a lot of people that in their lunch breaks, the 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock hour, uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the eating didn't take very long, but they just wanted to get away from their job for a little bit. They wanted to have a little bit of fellowship, maybe with somebody else, have a little bit of rest away from the location. So he decided uh, that he would start up a prayer meeting at that noon hour and just see if there was anybody that would actually come to that. So Lampier made up some flyers and, and uh, set the date. And uh, 
uh, and said it's going to be from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Anybody that wants to come can come, and we're just going to pray. And, uh, and he said, no, if you're, if you're praying, uh, you know, no prayer is supposed to last more than two minutes because everybody needs an opportunity to be able to pray if they want to pray. And, uh, and that, was, that was pretty much the stipulation that was there. Uh, the first day that they opened up, they were in a, uh, a lecture hall that he had rented. There was an open room, and had a little bit of room uh, that was in there. And, and uh, so 12 o'clock, nobody was there. 12.15, nobody was there. 12.30, there was one person that walked in the doors. And then he started hearing footsteps down the hall. There was another person and another person. It ended up the first meeting, they had six men in the meeting uh, during that lunchtime uh, hour. And they, it um, continued to grow. And by the second week, there were over 100 men that were in attendance. Before long, it was growing to such a degree that whenever people would travel into New York on business and they would go to their job, instead of trying to find the nice restaurant to go eat during the lunch hour, they would say, we want to go to the prayer meeting. And so there were people from all over the country that were coming in and they were going to these prayer meetings. And as God began to give them a similar burden to what he did to Lampier, they would actually go back home to their homes, wherever it was, and they would say, you know, there was such a burden that was there and, and such a need and such a, a meeting that was there in prayer, they, they would start up those same kind of prayer meetings in their own town. And God began to do a great work throughout this, uh, this nation. Before long, uh, New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania had thousands of different meetings and, and nobody really knew anything. You know, the, the communication wasn't all that great. You know, this is 1857 and 8. Uh, so there were a lot of people, they didn't know what the rest of the country was doing, but there were just a bunch of different people that were gathering together, seeing the need of prayer, and they were meeting, and they were praying. And all of this was going on around uh, the nation, thousands of people coming together to pray. And thousands of people getting great answers to prayer. God was answering in such a phenomenal uh, way. When it, I mean, everybody was just bringing and said, these are petitions. This is who it is that we need to pray for. We need to pray for this person. We need to pray for this event and this, this thing. And, and, and men were petitioning God. Samuel Prime wrote a book of the event. It was called The Power of Prayer. He wrote it in 1858. He said, men did not doubt, could not doubt, that God was moving an answer to prayer. It was the solemn conviction that silenced all opposition, that awakened the careless and the stupid, that encouraged and gladdened the hearts of Christians, causing a general turning to the Lord. It was amazing. Even the, uh, the, the media at that time, regular secular newspapers were covering the prayer meetings. They were talking about uh, all the events that were happening. Even the secular news media couldn't put a spin on it to say that it was something that was contrary to what it was that God was doing. It wasn't just a few religious zealots that were doing something. They recognized that God was doing a great work in the nation. And as all that was shaping up, there was a convulsion in the, in the commercial world that was causing people the very fear of losing everything that they had. All of their substance, all of their, all of their finances. Uh, the, the men that had, had once just sought after money has made that the point of their life were figuring out that their money couldn't help them. Their money was just on the cusp of being just blown away uh, for good. And, and so they had gotten to the point where they were considering Christ. It's pretty interesting because God had already met the need. The prayer meetings were already started before the financial collapse had actually began. And so men were seeking the Lord and, and what it is that the Lord wanted to do in their life. And, you know, whenever there's a need, God's also uh, the one who provides for the need. Amen? It's amazing whenever we think we've got a need, God already has the answer to it. He's already got something working out in the process to be able to get it resolved. And so Christians that had kept themselves from being roped up into the, the money mania that was going on at the time and actually uh, had sought God and had yielded themselves and said, you know, this is going to be the most important thing. And they, they had that burden uh, to be able to go and to pray and to be able to get these meetings started. All of that was already in place by the time this financial collapse had started to, to happen. And as such, those that were coming seeking real answers were finding Christ. It was called the Layman's Noonday Prayer Meeting is what it became known as, and it turned into a great national revival. One of the days of the prayer meeting, Lanfear wrote that there were many people in the prayer meeting that did not believe in Christ. He, was, he would kind of document some of the things as it was transpiring. He said there were a lot of people that did not believe in Christ, but they were under such heavy conviction of sin that they came to find the answer for their need. 
they knew that that was where they needed to be. I began to think about Paul and, and Silas with that Philippian jailer. Remember, uh, as whenever the jailer uh, looked and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And remember, they, uh, God shook the earth there and the, the, the doors of the prisons opened. The jailer thought that the, the prisoners were already escaped and gone and, and uh, he was getting ready to take his own life. And Paul called out and says, do thyself no harm, we're all here. And, and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And I've, I've made that statement before that most of the time whenever you're witnessing to somebody, uh, very seldom do you ever have anybody actually come to you and say, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You, you usually have to actually go to them. I've made that statement before. And it's a true statement, very seldom. As a matter of fact, nobody has ever come to me and said, uh, what must I do to be saved in that regard? There's, there's uh, you know, some burdens that are there, something like that. But, uh, but just on the street, nobody's ever just walked up to me and, and said something in that manner. Then I got to thinking, why not? Maybe it's not the custom of man that stands in the way. Sometimes we think about that. Well, people just don't do that today. People don't just, just come up to somebody else and ask them about that. Maybe it's the lack of prayer of the believer. Maybe it's the lack of praise that believers outwardly give to the Savior so that those that are under conviction of sin, they don't actually know where to turn. They don't actually know who it is that they can approach, where the answer's found. In our text, we see there's a very similar scenario. There's a fear among the people that has actually been spawned because of a financial matter. At the, at the end of chapter number 4, uh, Bar uh, Barnabas had, had sold some land. He gave the money to the Lord. He laid it at the apostles' feet, and everybody was excited about it. Uh, they were looking at those things, and, and everybody was so excited that, that uh, these two other folks, Ananias and Sapphira, they determined they're going to do the same thing, except they didn't do the same thing. Uh, they didn't do anything for the glory of God. What they were doing was trying to take something upon their own lust. It was for uh, themselves. So they sold some, some property and they kept back a part of the property, but then they bring some money to the church and they said, we're bringing it all to the church. We're bringing it all here. And, and, uh, and they weren't obligated in that giving. They didn't have to give it all. Nobody said that they did. As a matter of fact, Peter told them that in verse number four, he says, while it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou was not lied unto men, but unto God. Their sin was not in the giving. Their sin was in their lying. Their sin was that they were trying to take the glory of God for themselves. They wanted to take the attention away. Think about this. There's this great work that's going on here with the, uh, with the apostles. God is working in the midst of people. People are being added to the church, and, and, uh, and, then, and, and they're following the directing of the Spirit of God in Barnabas' case. But then there's a couple of people that are kind of outlying. And they're watching and they say, you know what? We could get some of that publicity too. And they began to take that upon themselves. And, and Peter tells me, he says, man, you, you lied to God. You're stealing glory that belongs to God alone. And they end up dying. One at a time, Ananias first, and then Sapphira comes in. She doesn't know what's happened. They just haul off Ananias. And then he says, guess what? Happening to you too. And boom, she falls over dead too. Now then, get down in, in chapter 5 to verse number 11. It says, And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. There was a fear that was instigated through finances. Amen? Man, all of a sudden this money thing's important. What in the world's happening? It's a matter of the heart. You know, if you're honoring God with your finances, you don't have the first thing to be concerned with. Amen? Right. Amen. But as the need for that removal of fear. So here it is, there's this fear that's moving on, and as that need for the removal of fear escalated, then what happens? They start looking for the answer. What's the answer in the midst of all of this? There, uh, there's been a lot of happenings to get to this point. So just kind of think about it. this is going to be the quick summation here of what's going on. There's been a lot of things that's going on to get all the people at the exact point that they're in. Remember, God's always working. Amen? Uh, God was working before you ever came to the service this morning. He was putting things together in my heart and your heart, and He was putting it all together so that His Word is going to meet the need of every person that comes here today. So the apostles, they've seen Jesus. They've seen Him give His life as a sacrifice for sin. They saw the resurrected Christ. They spent time with Him, and then they watched Him again as He ascended up into the heavens. They witnessed the events at Pentecost, and the addition of thousands to the church in Acts chapter 2. And not only that, but they were in one accord. That's a big one. Amen? They were all in one accord. What does that mean? If you want to know what it means to be here, how to get in one accord as a group of individuals, it does not mean that you lose your individuality. 
Amen. I mean, all right, uh, today we all have to wear the black shirt and the white vest. You know, uh, it's not about that. Uh, you don't do that. A local assembly has a lot of different personalities. Amen. You don't, you don't forget who it is that you are and who it is that God made you to be. Uh, we're an assembly of a lot of different people. You simply have a common mind, a common direction, a common purpose. You've got a common goal. You understand that there is a common direction in which we're going. The apostles called it in Acts 2 and verse number 46, a singleness of heart. That comes by being thoroughly right with God. The only way that you're going to have the same purpose, the same goal, a singleness of heart with other believers is if God is your cause. You've got to be thoroughly right with Him. The initial burden for others comes whenever we are thoroughly right with God ourselves. Can I tell you, we'll never have the right interest in anybody else until we personally have our lives right with God. As long as there's something that's standing in the way that we refuse to deal with, we talked about this a good bit in Sunday school, uh, whenever God begins to show us something, there is no sin that's just separate to ourselves. It's not just, well, this is my behind closed door sins. It affects all of your life. Everything that God is doing and that God wants to do in your family and in your church and in this town, it all relates back to our relationship with the Almighty God. So all of this has taken place there with one accord, and now they've witnessed Ananias and Sapphira, and they see that not only is God so gracious and so good and, and so loving, but He is also righteous and He is also just, and He pays attention to sin as well. So the apostles, as well as the, the public at large, they've got their hearts and their lives at a place where God can actually do a great work. What's the word we would use today? We'd use a word like tender. Their hearts were tender for the things of God. That's exactly what was taking place in 1858. The hearts of the people were tender toward the things of God. This morning I want us to see the prescription for being overshadowed and healed. Because that's what it leads to. First off, I want you to notice there's believers with burdens. There's believers with burdens. Uh, verse number 12, it says, And by the hands of the apostles there were signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Before there were signs and wonders wrought upon, among the people, there were some things that the disciples already had in place. There were some things that were already happening. First, uh, they were submitted to God's desires. They were submitted to God's desires. They had a burden for the Lord. Amen? They had a burden for the Lord. The disciples were, were laying hold on the Lord. They were laying hold on who the Lord Jesus Christ actually was. And think about the disciples here. Man, they got plenty of facts. Amen? They got a lot of facts. And they've got more illustrations and stories than you could ever imagine. They've got all that. They could sit there and somebody say, all right, tell us about what happened, you know, uh, two weeks ago. Man, they would have all kinds of stuff that they could tell them. Amen? They had all kinds of illustration, all kinds of facts, but it was different whenever you know a lot of facts versus being able to lay hold on God. Amen? There's a big difference in having your head full of all the things of the Bible and all the things that you're taught, and instead of being able to say, I want Christ. There's a big difference in laying hold on the Lord because whenever you lay hold on the Lord, it, listen, the, all the facts that you know do not change your heart. It's when you lay hold on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what changes your heart. That's whenever the Spirit of God begins to work in you and among you. And that's whenever you start looking personally and say, I don't want anything to stand between me and Him. You see, we have burdens for all kinds of things, but most of them are selfish. Most things that we have a burden for are things of our own desires. Very seldom do we say, man, I have got a burden for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be lifted up. How do I know? I can see it on faces whenever there's a lack of interest in what's being preached out of the Word of God. Shouldn't look at faces. Amen. But I look at faces. I see interest or lack thereof. I can tell it. You can tell it. You can tell it in a preacher. Amen. Whether it's this one, one on TV. What, you can tell if it's just a matter of the facts or if it's, man, it's the glory of God that we're here for. Amen. That's what had taken place with the apostles. They had all the facts. They had all the stories. Man, they could paint a picture like nobody's business. But they were getting to the point where they were laying hold on Jesus. Man, they were recognizing just who he was and what he did. And it was, oh, there was such a desire for him. 
Today there's got to be some Christians that are not just enamored with truths. There have to be some young people and, and some of all age groups that are not just content to be able to hear a story about Jesus and then get back to the phone as quick as they can. Sometimes we've got to put those things aside and say, I need Jesus. We need believers of every age with a burden for Christ. Those that are determined to live for Him, not just to know about Him. Whenever that determination is made, you know what will happen? What will happen is there will be Christians that get thoroughly right with God. I don't know about you at your house. Some of you don't have water yet. <clears throat> I was talking to somebody about this before. There was something special whenever we heard the news, water's coming. Amen? It was kind of disheartening whenever they said, oh, sorry, if tree fell down, burnt the thing up, you know, we've got to start up. <laughs> yeah. But there was something special whenever they said, oh, hey, water's coming. And you know, ever so often I'd get up and I'd go to the faucet. You know how exciting it was whenever I'd open the faucet and it'd go, psh. No water. Psh. That was it. What did that mean? Pressure's building. Amen. You know how exciting that is? Just to be able to say, hey, something's coming. Can I tell you, Christians need to have that same type of, uh, of desire and interest to be able to say, I know the truths of what God said, and guess what, man? He's coming. You start looking around and say, well, I think the Lord could come at any time. I don't think you really believe it. I don't really think so. Because if so, you'd be dropping stuff so quick you couldn't stand it just to be able to get more of God. There'd be more of an interest. We have to look and say, is it real? Are we really laying hold on the Lord? Because when we really do, man, God's shaping some stuff up. God's got something in mind. God's got an interest for the hearts of his people. God, man, he, there's a whole field of people that are sick and laid aside and need Christ. Secondly, they were, they were among the people. There was a burden for the Lord, but there was also a burden for the lost. Amen? You know, if you remember, they didn't always have that at the beginning. At the beginning of the book of Acts, remember, they were holed up in the upper room. What was it? They were so covered up with fear. They were scared to go out. They were scared to do anything. But after that day of Pentecost came, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they went out boldly preaching the gospel. And third, they were, they were absolutely sure of the message of Jesus. They had the message of change. They knew the message that they had was absolutely right. It's the gospel that brings about a change in man. Can I tell you, Christians should be known as people of the book. Amen. We should be known as people of the book. What does that mean? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God which ye have heard of us, ye received it not as the words or the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. People of the book have the book working in us. People of the book, it's not just a story book. It's not, just, it's not even something that we say, oh yeah, that's a good word. No, it's working in us effectually. I'm afraid there, there's much ground lost because Christians have gotten away from the Word of God. Amen? I think we, we, we commonly do that. We start looking for the next big thing, the next new thing, instead of the thing that God tells us to search. Jesus said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and there they would testify of me. He says, you want to search something? This is what you search. Get in the Word of God. John penned the words. I want you to turn with me real quick to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. Real quick. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 21. 1 John 2, 21. Think about these words that he says here. He says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. Now, what does that mean? There's a lot of, a lot of nots and no's in there. He says, so the thing about it, is he says, I've not written unto you because you know not the truth. He says, I'm not writing you stuff that you have never heard of before, but because you know it and that no lies of the truth. It's a great verse. John's saying, I'm not telling you some new thing that you've never heard. You know, sometimes we fall into that. Amen. We want to know some new thing that we've never heard before. Yeah, preacher, you've heard that one before. You've preached that before. I think you've already said, use that verse. It'll probably get used again. Amen? We, 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 we commonly, we look for something new. He says, I'm telling you the same thing again, the things that you already know, 
so that it gets done. Amen. And why did God include that verse in the Bible? It's because He knows that man has this tendency to always be looking for something else. We have this tendency to want the next new thing instead of the truth that He's already given. He said, if you want to have a burden for the things of God, and you want to have a burden for the lost, he said, get back into the thing that I've already given you before, because he said, that'll light you on fire for, for as long as you're here. So the apostles, think about it. Here they are, they're armed with the Word of God. They are empowered by the Spirit of God, and they're burdened for those who need the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And verse number 12 tells us that whenever, that's whenever the many signs and wonders were done. Back in our text, Acts 5, 12, it's by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Can I tell you, it was a great answer to prayer to get to that point, to that verse, that time, that day. It was an answer to prayer. All of these things are working, and they're working in response to prayer. Now, look back with me real quick in chapter 4. And what happened was Peter and John were arrested. They're brought before the Jewish leaders. Uh, they, they amazed the Jews because they spoke, they spoke boldly for Christ. They had, uh, there was nothing else to be done. They couldn't, uh, the, the leaders couldn't do anything, so they said, all right, we've we got to release you. So they got released. And guess what they did? The very first thing they did, whenever they get released, they start praying. Now look at what they pray in Acts Chapter 4, go down to verse 29. They're praying and they say, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They're praying and they're asking, it says, Lord, would you equip us with those signs and wonders so that people will be healed? Verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Verse number 12 in our text, we can see that's God's answer. They're praying. They say, well, oh, would you do the signs and wonders? Verse 12 says, and many signs and wonders were done. They were all gathered together. They were in Solomon's porch. Solomon's porch was outside the main portion uh, of the temple. And so it was a great gathering place. It was, a place, it was kind of a plaza, uh, preaching and fellowship and testimony. And all the people that are gathered there, guess what? They start marveling at what's being spoken instead of arguing. Typically, when everybody wants to get together and share their ideas, it's going to lead to arguments. Amen? Because your idea is different than my idea, and my idea is always going to be better, right? So there's all the arguments that are there. But here there's no arguments going on. They're all just marveling. And the apostles are boldly proclaiming Christ. And after seeing God's judgment, the people are all in one accord. They want to hear the message that's actually being proclaimed. I was thinking about Lampier, 1857. You know, he already had the burden for the things of God. He already had an interest for what God wanted. He was already, he was already handing out tracts. He was already faithful. He had a burden for people to, to know Jesus as Savior. But if he, was, if he was to know the specifics about what it was that God wanted for him to accomplish, he knew there was something else, but for him to know what it was, he said, I've got to pray. And he consistently prayed, what wilt thou have me to do? What is the great interest? that you have in my life. He had a burden. It wasn't just a passing phase. You, know, you think about the importance of tracts, invitations. Those are great. Amen? Everybody say amen. Everybody, every Christian should be handing them out. But that is not the end of the matter. Witnessing should be our, honestly, that should be our bare minimum. Amen? I mean, that's just called being a Christian. God never told us to, to live different than our profession. I always said we're supposed to live according to Christ. We're supposed to have that godly profession. It would be disobedience otherwise. If Paul and Silas had not been singing at the midnight hour, if they had not been praising God, even in the hard time, after they'd already been beaten, left in the stocks and, and everything else, if they had not been faithful in praise, it, that means they would have been disobedient to God because they weren't giving Him praise in everything. Amen. Then that, that jailer would have never bound in there and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He was just taking his own life. Says, the answer's not here. Our prayer time, our witnessing, our Bible study, our church attendance, our giving, all of those things should be commonplace 
for the believer. All of those things are just common for those that know Christ. That interest is, is developed in every person that knows what Jesus has done for them. The more that you actually think about what Christ has done for me, man, those are, those are the easy things. Amen? Man, those are the things that you have a joy in being able to do. God has a personal interest in the individual believer. He also wants every believer to be reaching others. He, he handles the specifics. Amen? He handles the details. He's got it all worked out. All we have to do is yield. We just have to humble ourselves to Him. And He gives that burden. He gives the details. He gives the ministry. He, he lines it all out. It'll be in His timing. It'll be in his, for His glory. Amen? It's all for Him. Now, think about the, the um, disciples. Peter had a different task than Paul. John had a different ministry than Barnabas. They were all different in that regard. Each one of them had a specific way that God wanted to use them, but they had to yield to God and make themselves available before God's direction was actually known. That was their interest. So then there comes the other side. Those that are in need are coming with their concerns. So the, the disciples, are they're, they're getting ready. Amen. They've got a burden for the Lord. They've got a burden for the lost. They've got the message that changes lives. They're, all that's being put in together. God's working in their heart. God's doing that. But in the meantime, there's those that are sick, those that are afflicted. Well, they're understanding too. Hey, I'm seeing the same thing. These guys are in one accord. There's one name that's been lifted up. It's the name of Jesus. Hey, let's, let's get everybody there. So they're coming with their concerns. Verse 13 says, Of the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. When God's people are right with God and right with each other, you know what happens? Other people start coming too. Amen. There's an interest there. When God's position was noted, how was his position noted? Well, first of all, he's got the praise of the disciples. Amen. They are praising him. And then on the other side, they've seen the judgment of sin. They understand those things and they're working together and everybody understood the reality of God. Uh, nobody, now think about this, verse 13 again, it says, of the rest does no man join himself to them. You know, nobody was following the Pharisees. Isn't that something? Nobody said, well, a lot of them just went over there to the Pharisees. Nobody was following the Pharisees. Why? They weren't in one accord. They didn't have any, any answer. There, there was no interest. Uh, the, the people knew that, that the Pharisees were only interested in themselves. Amen? They had a lot of stuff. They had nice garments. All that kind of thing. Man, they had a lot of clout. But they weren't helping the people in need. And the folks in need knew that. Verse number 17 uh, says that it caused the Pharisees to be filled with indignation whenever God was doing something. They were so mad about it. Now look at it, verse 13, uh, the second part it says, but the people magnified them. There was a new admiration of the apostles. People are taking notice now. They're, they're, they're magnif they magnified the believers. And this was not about man worship. Amen. It wasn't exalting them as gods or anything of that nature. But it was like in Acts 4.13 it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Think about that. The religious council guaranteed these were not the people that were worshiping Peter and John. Amen. They were not interested in the apostles or the name of Jesus being lifted up, up at all. But they certainly recognized the very source of all of the ability. The disciples were sharing the Word of God. They were doing it full of grace and truth, just like Jesus did. It was said that Jesus, <clears throat> or of Jesus, that the common, the common people heard Him gladly. Amen? They were, they were glad to be able to hear the words of Jesus. He never, uh, he never excused sin, never once. But whenever He gave truth, it was always mixed with grace as well. There was nothing of the, now think about this, you got people that are starting to look at the disciples. There was nothing of the disciples there, the, the apostles that, that honestly deserved any kind of worship at all. Amen? Anybody that had been around knew their background. Remember James and John, sons of thunder, hotheads? Peter was the one who denied the Lord. Matthew, a tax collector and a disgrace to his company, or his uh, country, selling out to the Romans. Thomas was a doubter. They had a terrible start. But guess what? They were living testimonies that the message of the Lord Jesus Christ will change you. Change them. When the multitude saw the signs and the wonders, they began to magnify the disciples because their lives gave evidence of the Word of God. There was such a change that was there. And those in need came. Said, this is the answer. 
We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to go down. But we know this is the answer to what we need. Thirdly, I want you to notice that God overshadows the problem. God overshadows the problem. Still awake? Say amen. amen. Verse 14, it says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Being overshadowed. That's an interesting thought, amen? Think about it. So if they could just be overshadowed. Two constants at work. You start thinking about shadows, amen? So they're, they're being overshadowed. You've got a couple of things. First of all, you've got to have light, amen? You, you'll never have a shadow if you don't have light. Well, guess who the light is? That's the Lord. Amen. First of all, you got the Lord. He is always going to be the Lord. Amen. Isaiah 40 verse 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. He said, hadn't you heard that the Lord is always going to be the Lord? Haven't you heard that the Lord never gets tired? He doesn't get weary. He doesn't throw in the towel. He doesn't faint. So there's a constant. And then the other constant is those that are in need. Those that are in need. Verses 15 and 16 says there's, there's every degree of suffering and sickness, sin, the effects of it that are taking place. It's all there. And can I tell you that has not changed. That's still the same today. Everybody comes with different needs. Everybody has different problems. You can go through and, and typically as people we like to pick on somebody else's sin that's not your sin. That's the worst sin. Oh, your sin's the worst sin. Amen? Amen. Sure it is. So, well, my sin's not that bad. It's yours. It's the one that's sending you to hell. Amen? I would say that's bad. I mean, whatever it is, your sin is the worst sin. But sometimes we start picking on somebody else's. Wait a minute. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We were singing that Wednesday. It was great. Y'all should have been here. <laughs> so, all the sin sickness, it's all there. All the problems still there. But you got the Lord. And guess what? In between, you've got the one that's cast in the shadow. Amen? In between, you got those that have the ability to deliver the sin, the sinful and the sin sick from their bondage with what? The message of the gospel. That's what they got. They got the message of the gospel. Jesus told the disciples in John 4 and verse 35, He says, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already unto harvest. What is the harvest? A bunch of needy people. He says, man, there's a bunch of sinners out there. They sure need to be delivered. Amen. That shadow, what is it? It's not like Peter's shadow had some miraculous thing where, you know, the pa shadow passed by and, all, poof, you know, and they're just healed and, you know, run around. It was the shadow that did it. Now, the shadow represents that level of influence. You know, our influence, our shadow gets greater the closer to the light that we get. Amen. Farther away from the light, you don't have as much of a shadow. You get close to the light, shadows everywhere. That's certainly true. The, the, the closer you get to the light, the more shadow that you cast, the, the closer we get to the Lord, the less of us is known, and the more of Christ is known, the source of the light. God is seen. You know, as men, oftentimes what will happen is we try to hijack what God is doing just like Ananias and Sapphira. That's what they were doing. God was doing a work. Amen? God was doing a great work. And they try to take it over. We'll take some of that. We'll take some of that glory. They try to hijack God's work. Those noonday prayer meetings, it led to a great revival that went to, through our nation, all parts of the nation. And, and the character, you know, if you start studying revivals and all the type of efforts and all those type of things that go on, this revival was so much different than any other revival, especially that had taken place like in the 1830s. We, we read about those great revivals that took place during that time frame. But this one was so different because there was no revivalist. There was not one name, one person that this great revival of the country was hung upon. It wasn't a revival machine that was going through. Uh, there, was, uh, there was no thought where people were saying, well, let's try to keep it up. Keep the enthusiasm going. Keep the momentum going. That's what we got to do. There was no, 
there was plenty of excitement, amen. Plenty of, of, of joyful enthusiasm, but it wasn't an event or an excitement event that people were trying to trump up to be able to get. That wasn't the essence of the revival. It's not what it was at all. And again, this happens a lot. I was thinking, uh, you know, it wasn't, was it two years ago? Had the big tent revival uh, out in, I think it started in North Carolina, I forget. Uh, but anyway, I think it started in Mother's Day and went on through the summer. I mean, man, they just kept going. There were, there were uh, buses of, of church folks that were coming under these tents. Did y'all read about that? Did you watch them? Uh, they had them live streaming. It was on Facebook. And so uh, anyway, there was, there was just all these thousands and thousands of people. You could, you could look, it looked like I-20 I right now with the ice. You know, it's a big parking lot. And, and it looked like that, all of the interstates that were there. But the, the, the church building wouldn't hold it anymore. So they ended up going out to a city block. And there was somebody, uh, the, a businessman who had that city block. And he said, it was all vacant. And he said, look, you can use my block. And and so they ended up getting some big tents and they put them out there. This is the heat of summer. Amen. Hot. And all, and all these people were coming, just tons of people getting saved. And, you know, toward the end of it, then there were some people. This stood up and said, we need to do this all over the country. We're all chipping in. We're buying a big tent. We're going on the road. What happened? Don't hear anything else about it. Why? Man tries to hijack what God is doing. It happens a lot. Man's got this idea. We'll say, well, we'll do it. We're, thanks for showing us what you want. God will take it from here. Oh, it's God. It's God. How do we start seeing what God does? Yield. Just get close to Him. See, it's never about man's efforts. It's about man getting out of the way. Presenting Christ. It's about getting so close to the Lord that you can't help but have your Influence that shadow of your influence cast out. When Peter walked by, it was his shadow that got the attention, not him. It was the light of the gospel that was making a change in people's life. Got a quote for you, and we'll close. It says, as a nation, we're becoming rapidly demoralized by worldliness, our ambition, our vanity, and our vices. The true, the great end for which we believe this nation was raised up is being lost sight of. The very foundations are moving. We need this to bring us to our senses. That was written by Samuel Prime in 1858 when he saw what God was doing through the nation. Can I tell you, as you look around, we need to get back to our senses today. Get back to the response, back to prayer, back close to the Lord. Every Christian should be getting as close as we can to Christ. We need to realize the length of the shadow that we cast. It may be getting shorter instead of longer. We need to be getting closer to the Lord. When we begin to give honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll hear those around us. I don't have any doubt saying, what must I do to be saved? If you're here, maybe you're listening online, you don't know Christ as Savior. Look past the ideas of man. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you, gave his life for you. Receive Christ as your Savior. That's where it starts. Let's all stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Our Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the great love that you have for us. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you speak to hearts, Lord, throughout generations, throughout ages. We have it recorded in the Bible. We've got it recorded in history. And, and Lord, certainly we need you today. I pray, Lord, that we're quick to humble ourselves to you. Lord, to be able to put ourselves aside. And Lord, to draw close to Christ. Oh God, if there's one here that's living at a distance from you, and, and Lord, they're getting okay with it. Lord, would you draw them back to you? Lord, would you help each of us individually and as a church to be in one accord for the cause of Christ, drawing close to you, honoring the Lord in all things, Lord, putting your word first. Dear God, I ask that you would do a mighty work in our midst. Lord, I pray that there would be a great revival that starts, and I pray, God, that we would be the elements of it, just simply humbling ourselves to you, making ourselves willing vessels. Lord, fill us and use us for your glory. If there's one here that does not know Christ as Savior, Lord, give them the strength to be able to step forward. Lord, to be able to come and receive Christ as Savior, to live for you. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to sing page 306 this morning. If you need to come and pray, why don't you come pray? <clears throat> Find a place in an altar. Oh, man, what a great time it is to be able to be surrendered to the will of God. 306, have thine own way, Lord. 
Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it and still. Have thine own way. Thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior dear. Let's sing that last verse. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fear with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I hope you'll be able to make it back tonight. <clears throat> I trust the roads are going to be clear. I think they said they are. So anyway, use your good judgment there. If it's not, you know, stay home. Don't slide off the road. And, um, but anyway, we'll certainly keep everything on. We do have choir practice this evening, and so we'll, we'll do that. Let's do 530. Amen. Everybody say 530. All right, good deal. And uh, we'll meet then and go over just a little bit before the evening service. And, um, and then we'll be jumping right in. Got a long service. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. Go ahead and warn you. Uh, tonight, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit. Amen? So if you're, like, if you're already like, I can't stand to be there any longer than I have to, this is not going to be the service for you. <clears throat> but we will jump right in pretty quick, and I think it will be a blessing to you. But let's be closed out in a word of prayer. Brother Coy Caps, would you dismiss us, please? <laughs>